Hello, everyone. Books with Banks back again. And I am so grateful today to be joined by Ian Esselmont. Mr. Esselmont, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Esselmont is the author of the novels of the Malazan Empire series, as well as the Malazan prequels, the Path to Ascendancy series, uh, of which Forge of the High Mage, uh, right here, uh, it has just come out in some markets around the world, uh, some bookstores, but unfortunately not quite yet in the U.S. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get my hands on a copy. I've just read it and I loved it. And I thought, who better to sit down or to invite to have a discussion about this book, Malazan in general. Um, so, yes, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on the channel. How are you today? How's writing going? Yeah. Well, it's great to be here on uh, Books of the Banks, so thank you for the invite, uh, and I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about um, all things uh, Malaz. Uh, so you asked about um, how things are going now, or? Uh, yeah, sure. If, uh, yeah, are there any, you know, writing updates? Um, I know Malaz and fans are always, whenever they click on one of these videos, whatever the title is, I think what, speaking as a uh, Malazan fan. Uh, we're always kind of eager to see where things are at, what's being written, what's being worked on. Yeah, yeah well, I have started on the next one. Okay. Um, I, I'm under con, I, I pitched to um, Bantam um, 3 in this new Paths to Ascendancy series uh, and Forge is first and I'm working on the second one now. Right. Uh, and, and I'm sorry to, to say that it is going a little bit slow, like okay. like Ford. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm just getting older. Uh, I don't know. Or more picky. Um, but I I like to, to try to do a, something different with each project. Like each book, each concept I have uh, demands sort of a different treatment. Uh, so the first series, uh, Path to Ascendancy, was really of a, a set the three really fit together and they were very similar. But now with this new series, pl paths plural, mm -hmm. I'm looking at different paths and different characters, routes uh, and story arcs and development. All right. Thank you. Uh, does, uh, do you mind if I ask if that uh, goes back to novels of the Malazan Empire where you, uh, when you wrote that, your, your main set of six novels was that uh, each volume and you wanted to explore something different you wanted to do something different back then right. um yeah individually for each book i think it has a each book has a slightly different flavor but then looking back at the end of the six i realized that really what i was doing was telling one big story uh -huh. and the the main um vehicle was the sort of the, the stark story of the uh, crimson guard uh, and which I suppose some people would, would say, well, why is it novels of the Malazan Empire when you're dealing with <laughs> a different uh, set of characters? Uh, but it's all of the world. It's sort of like looking back in history and, and assigning a particular period in history a name. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're the only players in that right. period. It's just that they are one of the dominant political forces at, the, uh, at that time. Sure. Uh, my, uh, I, I don't necessarily want to spend too much time talking about like that series um, or some of your older works, uh, but I was just, I just had a brief phone call with my brother, uh, who's also a fan of your work, and more than anything else he's read of yours, he loves uh, book five from that series, Blood and Bone, uh, and he just noted in the call that I had with him how much it stands apart from the rest of them and tone and how grim and kind of gritty it is, but also in the darker humor. Uh, so uh, I, I guess the question coming out of that would be when you exploring different things with each of your novels, are those, whatever you're looking at, is that influenced by things you've recently read, things that are going on in the world, conversations you've had? I, I guess, where does the inspiration for Ooh, I, I want to try this next time. Like, like, where does that inspiration come from? Um, well, I guess, like many authors, much of it is life experience. Uh, I drew on a lot of my uh, four years that I lived in uh, Southeast Asia and things that my wife and I did traveling through the region and working. Uh, I drew a lot on that. 
of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, I found that um, this is going back a ways, but it, um, back the 80s, 90s, the, a lot of the fantasy was, of course, set in a sort of a pseudo northern European setting right all the time it was sort of the default fantasy setting and that of course is a legacy coming to us from Tolkien and and the other famous authors <clears throat> in the genre and so I decided well I'm going to try and uh, do uh, a sort of a counter default where in, people would say well if it's going to be fantasy it will of course be set in uh, Europe a northern European setting or and I said well I'm going to do one that's set in the jungle uh, and uh, see how how that goes over <laughs> uh, and I think that it was a, a good choice in the that's a very rich very rich setting very deep in history um, lots of uh, great uh, spiritual influences that I could draw on to to sort of build up that part of the world. Any uh, any plans to return to that setting? Obviously, I don't want you to, I, I'm not asking you to give things away, but I'm just kind of curious if you've ever that or thought about returning to the specific kind of continent where that happened, where that book takes place. Well, it's strange. It seems like what I'm doing is sort of hot setting everything out like look visiting all these different regions and um fleshing them out and presenting them to the reader so in that sense i'm not done i've got more <laughs> more regions to look at all right all right that's, that's great great to hear um yeah uh, i i guess i uh, for for everyone watching, so far we've uh, at least for this intro we've tried to keep it pretty spoiler free, uh, and I might ask one or two more questions uh, along those lines, but I will give a spoiler spoiler warning for uh, for all of you once we get to uh, the spoiler section to specifically zone in on Forge of the High Mage. Um, but before we get there, now that you're writing prequels and that Steve is. Uh, also writing prequels and sequels. Um, is there a lot of kind of communication about the different settings you're exploring, different characters you're using in these series outside of your each respective main main series? Is there a lot of back and forth? Oh, I'm doing this. Well, I'm doing this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, funnily, as the years pass, we're actually spending more and more time um, going over stuff together. Uh, it was much more laissez-faire uh, 10 years ago, uh, but now I think we're treading on each other's feet a little bit closer now, so we're uh, spending more time discussing the, what we're doing. Um, and I'm doing the, the prequel, so I'm worried about, you know, co continuity and things sure. like that. Uh, but Steve just reminds me, he says, you know, you're telling your stories mm -hmm. and you're and the characters are you're looking at the world through their point of view, which could differ. And they could have a different view of history than someone over on some other area. And of course, that makes perfect sense. And it's something that we've actually been playing with through the whole series. Uh, so now I, I'm not sure if this really. I don't think this really counts much as a spoiler, uh, but I did notice in uh, this recent book, there are two maps. Um, there's one at the beginning of the book and one at the end. Uh, and I had a conversation with Erickson a few months ago, and he mentioned that there might be a weasel and ferret type of feuding dynamic uh, that pops up in some way, shape or form. Uh, and I was happy to see that there are some historian characters that seem to have different understandings of the the map or of the geographic uh, kind of setting that this book takes place in. Uh, I was curious if you'd care to comment on that or elaborate on that sort of bit of comedy there. Um, yeah, um, that's just uh, human nature. Uh, we have, um, you know, ambitious scholars, historians vying for um, uh, prestige and their careers are maybe clashing and they have different views on on things uh and that it's just just of course an, an echo of actual real scholarship uh and you have uh maybe i don't know if it's less so now but back in the day there was a lot of big egos 
you know, crashing against each other in various disciplines, like you name it, psychology, history, archaeology, uh, you, and, and you had people staking out their turf and um, trying to even control the narrative of the knowledge of that discipline, for example. And so there, uh, we're playing a lot with um, knowledge, the idea of the perpetuating perpetuation of, of knowledge uh, and how it can be, people are trying to control it and direct it in certain ways. Uh, and, and again, if you look at Steve's and, my, and our work in, in all the 30 books or so, that, that's a recurring theme. Okay. Uh, I, I'm curious when, uh, when you go to select the maps that are going to be used for any book in particular, uh, are, are there binders of these things from gaming sessions? Are there different, like, like the two maps used here, were, did both of those exist in some way, shape or form back when you all were gaming together or uh and then like you pulled them out and said oh these are very different or anything Th does anything like that ever happen or right yes uh steve has these binders he's got okay. them okay he's a um he was a much more prolific map uh creator than i uh and he would give me blank outlines like um again Abacus, for example and i filled it in um, so we sort of traded it off and, and took turns, uh, but he's got the majority. I have my binder, but it's it's slimmer uh, than than all of the records that he has for uh, maps. And uh, we've both moved a lot. You know, I've moved around a lot since then, and so has he. Uh, but I, I think we did a pretty good job at keeping most of it from the landfill. Okay, okay great. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then um, maybe just one, uh, one more quick question, again, before getting into spoilers. Um, and we can elaborate on this point in the spoiler section. Uh, but for now, I'm just wondering if kind of coming out of those gaming sessions, um, with your books, were there any characters you were really eager to explore, wh whether this be the novels of Malazan Empire or Path to Ascendancy Trilogy or the New Paths to Ascendancy Trilogy. Uh, in any of those series, were there characters that maybe you gamed as um, anyone that you just really, really were dying to get on onto the page, were excited to write about? And did you play them or did he play them or were they... DM character or not DM. You can, find, you can find characters that he played and I played. Um, uh, for example, if Steve was running, then the, the characters he was playing would be strictly speaking would be NPCs, sorry, okay. non-player characters. Sure. Uh, but then we might swap, and I might run. I was running a session using some of those NPCs myself, and for him, for his characters, and so if really we traded off a lot, and. There's a lot of favorites, of course, who I really like, but I find what really drives the selection is the thematics that are uh, pushing like this that particular project. And then I think about which characters I could use best to explore those and bring them out and demonstrate them. Uh, so, and as I do that, then, and of course, this is, you know, any novelist really, I'm sure, once they get into that character and start exploring him or her more and more, then that then they become the favorite, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and, and yeah, I guess uh, before, uh, again, sorry, I keep adding one more little thing uh, before we get to this next section. Uh, but is there anything you'd like to say to anyone watching right now who hasn't been able to pick up the book yet any kind of tease or ad you'd sort of like to give uh for for this new book uh i, I tried to do a sort of spoiler free review of it about a week ago but uh maybe it would sound better coming from uh from the author himself <laughs> no I, all i will say is um apologies frankly oh. um it wasn't my idea for this uh to happen for oh. things to go this way uh so i you know don't blame me um, but there's been a lot of tumult in the, in the industry. You know, lots of projects have been pushed back. Some have even been canceled. It's uh, there's it's um, 
you know, it's, it's different now, I think, than it was in pre-COVID. Uh, but we're getting, I think we're getting back into the swing of things. Um, I think the backlogs and paper shortages are sort of reducing uh, and we're managing <laughs> to get back in the swing of things. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and yeah, I'll splash a uh, spoiler warning up on the screen now. Uh, but Gorge of the High Mage, uh, I loved it. If Dancer's Lament isn't my favorite of these kind of newer prequel books, uh, then this one is. I I, I enjoy all four of them, but um, particularly how close we were to Dancer in that first one, I loved. And then, I mean, well, sort of um, the complete opposite end. Uh, Dancer and Kellenved are around a lot in this book, but I feel like it really is, it, or it felt to me like the story of their supporting kind of team, um, their Tatrin and uh, Dujak and Dasim, uh, at least in one side of the story. And then, of course, the other side of the story, everything exploring the Falaran archipelago. Um, I I guess, hmm, I guess here's a question. Way back, uh, I felt like I read somewhere or I heard that this or the working title for this book was the uh, the Gestal. Uh, which makes sense because the what is it this monster this thing coming from the sea what could it be that looms large like that's a big big deal for the Falaran characters um, eventually for everyone uh, but I, I'm curious when that name changed to Forge of the High Mage um, because yeah I, I'm just just curious about that process yeah. sure uh, yes for um, a long time the the working title was the Gestal. Uh, and which, of course, references this, whatever it is, this weapon that uh, is uh, at the con under the control of the priests in the Falarn <coughs> archipelago. Um, but uh, my publisher um, expressed some concern that it's a bit too um, inside baseball, as they say. It was too inside the world. And so people who weren't Re Malazan readers would look at that and it would be a meaningless title for them. It wouldn't convey anything. Uh, and so we had a, some back and forth, back and forth. What about this? What about that? And eventually, um, with the help of some other readers, pre-readers, uh, we settled on uh, Forge of the High Mage. And I was happy with that. But I, at the time, I hadn't thought about Steve's Forge of Darkness. And I and, we try to not use the same terms in our title. <laughs> that one snuck in. That one, that by me. <laughs> Is the next one going to be called Fall of Hairlock or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope not to tread too similarly there. Okay. Be quite different. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and then I, I guess in choosing to tell the specific story that you told here, this specific moment in the found or the early days of the empire. Um, I mean, I know early on in the book they reference everything going on in uh, like Corel Stratum that like that whole war going on down there. Um, and I, I guess I'm just curious. And also, Crimson Guard characters are making references to wherever Skinner and then wherever Shimmer are. Um, I'm curious what make or what what reasons went into you choosing this specific kind of this part of the early Malazan days to focus on and not any of kind of those other things that sound like they're happening around the world. Why, why was it important or wh why were you excited to tell this story about the Malazans trying to take on Falar? Um, right. I, I, we hadn't really gamed this actual okay. um, campaign, um, but I thought it would be, the one that to tackle to show um, the, um, the the power structure that we've created the um, the empire, it's trying to step up onto the world stage. It's its first sort of major uh, commitment off of its own mainland. Um, for example, you could say well Corel, but that um, was pulled pulled back from and it was considered. Uh, 
a, a failure. Yeah. So, and a lot of people in the book are worried that this a campaign could also be a failure as well. Um, and here we find them sort of, um, it's like growing pains, if you will, right? They're, they're sort of trying to get in, step up into a bigger stage and there are missteps uh, and things sort of go awry uh, and it's just sort of telling the tale of, of that. And I thought Falar would be, is, is like the, I thought would be the best place to uh, set that story. Um, and I, I honestly in uh, your novels of the Malazan Empire, um, as well as uh, the Malazan Book of the Fallen, I was never, I never felt really one way or another about Tatrin. Um, however, starting with Dead House Landing uh, and that brilliant backstory that uh, that you gave us there, um, everything that happened on the uh, Kartul Island, I believe, right? Um, everything there. Uh, and then what you did with his character in this book, in a lot of ways, he seemed like one of, one of two or three main characters of this book um and i i get i'm curious i'm curious what draws you to the tatron character um maybe even going back to dead house landing why uh why, why you felt like um that was the time to give us that, that really fascinating kind of um inquisition type storyline with his uh, his whole background and and then why and then why we're seeing a lot of these events in Forge of the High Mage through his point of view as opposed to Dujax or Dasims or um, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, I'm curious about that. Yeah, um, that's sort of it's sort of his story in many ways and and um, in a lot of other um, channels and videos that I see the people who are doing book reviews and such they talk about um uh, characters being likable you know like oh i like this character or, i like the book because i like this character mm -hmm. or i can relate to this character so i i it was really relatable uh and i think that that's i personally guess the wrong approach to take to a, a novel um there it it really its success shouldn't count on having nice characters Right, <laughs> because that's just one thin little facet of the human experience right i mean you don't like everyone you meet right, right. <laughs> and you have your friends that are smarter uh and they're the people who you've chosen to like and get to know and explore uh and so the challenge then is to present a character who is not particularly likable uh, and Tashrin, frankly, is hard to get to like. Uh, he's a tough, tough sell. Uh, as a, he's not warm, uh, and he is not demonstrative. He's not interested in people. There's uh, all kinds of things about him that aren't, you know, nice. Right. Uh, and, and so then the challenge is how can you make the readers sort of understand how this person could have developed and, and what's behind their... Uh, uh, front and and why are they so very closed off and what is it about them that makes them that that way? Right, right. Um, I think I uh, I'll keep it to kind of what Tayshun's going through right? and that storyline, uh, and then maybe later we can move on to everything happening up in the archipelago, uh, because that is just some of the most I don't it. It seemed, at least to me, oh, we'll we'll we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, with what the Malazans are doing. Uh, so for anyone uh, watching uh, who hasn't read it yet but doesn't really mind spoilers, uh, basically, uh, Kellen Vett and Dancer have divided their forces. One force is going by land uh, north over the uh, like the wastes and the mountains in the Quantilly continent, and then another smaller group is kind of picking up a bunch of pirate uh, like uh, nonsense kind of sailors and stuff and taking them up uh, by sea. And I guess the plan is to sort of to rendezvous up north in the archipelago and conquer this land. Um, the Tatrin storyline uh, is, Tatrin the High Mage is with uh, under Commander Dujek, uh, one arm, uh, who has lost his arm uh, recently uh, when this book starts. 
um, and their their whole group is heading north through the mountains, and uh, and then they come across some very interesting uh, cultures, and I. I feel terrible. I'm blanking on her name right now, but uh, the high priestess of uh, the of the the bees. Or, sorry, Ular. Ular, Ulara. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ular, I yeah, I <laughs> love this character, and I honestly, I mean, even though I guess we we got or you gave us her journey north up into the mountains um, in book three uh, in um, Kellenbed's Reach. But I, I'm not sure why. I just thought, okay, well, she's off to just live with them, and that's that's what that's all we'll see of her. Fine. Um, but then to see her play such a powerful and like prominent leadership role here uh, in what she and her clans are and her people are investigating uh, in the north, and then them first fighting the Malazans, and then eventually working kind of with, or at least staying out of the Malazans' way. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I would just love to hear you comment on her as high priestess and her whole storyline. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't necessarily have to see her. I would just, I happened to be going into that region and, and I thought, well, who is there? And, and I realized, oh, there's this, 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 this or there. And so we can have to use them. Uh, and um, we had seen her sort of sent off and and I was happy with that I thought that was fine she had her arc somewhere uh so it it wasn't pre-planned so to speak okay. yeah. I didn't have it in mind back in Kalimba's reach that wasn't what I had in, uh, intended uh it just simply uh, was was a nice thing to pick up there um and again this is of course major spoiler stuff um yeah. for those who uh <clears throat> I read the first three we have this character and, and now is a returning character at least for this particular novel all right uh and uh i i get i've been I, i'm just so excited to talk about them because they fascinate me so much but uh the main kind of set piece the main obstacle uh that the malazans face that ulara and uh the clans up or the uh, tribes up in the mountain space and this part of the story is an old moving mountain um, <laughs> machine construction of the Kachane people um, and similar to a sky keep but from what I understood uh, it just sort of it elevates a bit and then moves but doesn't really it doesn't fly like a moon spawn might um, and yeah just when I guess first it's some scouts that Ulara sent out, they encounter uh, the Kachain, uh, and then you have this whole party of just kind of a shipwrecked, uh, this team of shipwrecked people, and they yeah. um, they ha are forced to work for the Jagged, who has sick, dying, crazy Jagged, who has um, taken over this uh, Kachain construction. Um, I just I would love to hear your thoughts on the Kachain, on this their technology, the storyline. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We you know we've seen the sky keeps of a, a, a number of them appearing here and there, uh, and then Steve and I were talking that, about that, and he said, well, you know, they don't all have to be sky keeps, and uh, you know how how are they? What are the other sort of um, communities do they possess and so i thought about well we we could have one on 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 land and it would be an early very very ancient attempt at a sky keep and the sort of what prototype that uh uh doesn't just only just gets up a little bit uh, of course would be these remnants of older efforts before they perfected their uh, technologies and, and managed to succeed with the, uh, the Skykeep. Uh, and, and this was, um, again, it was uh, you know, lost to history and they were sleeping, they were um, hibernating, um, but then they get interfered with um, by this Jagu seeking revenge. And again, uh, for many novels, if you, have sort of a monster character like Katane Shamal, then they're the villain, right? They're the, right. the 
the threat that has to be defeated. Uh, but here I thought, well, why don't I make them the victims? And in fact, they are. They're being taken advantage of. They're being used cruelly. Uh, and so instead of being, uh, we sort of find instead of being monsters, they're, you know, something else. There's um, just having as much troubles as the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, I, I, I believe, I, if I'm not like, you know, misremembering um, any storylines from your other books, this is the most you've ever worked with the Kachane species. Um, so, yeah. And I, is it, particularly fun to write them or write about them or are there certain challenges that come with that that I found it to be very challenging uh, very oh. difficult. yeah um that's just how it, it uh, the constraints I set for this particular hive or group uh it, it was I was quite constrained by uh what was being done there um so I don't feel that I got to deal with a fully uh, flowered, fully aware, uh, and strong um, character set for them, uh, maybe in the future. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I love seeing them. I also love seeing the particular Jagger character um, returning for his revenge. And uh, yeah, and I mean, just the descriptions of the heat and the machinery and the kind of oppressive like I don't know just being in that structure um that moving mountain I thought was it was so intriguing uh so yeah I reading about those characters that were I guess basically forced into working uh there um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> captured forced, yeah forced uh manual labor um, uh, and yeah I'm also there it did seem like there was uh, maybe a bit of comedy there with how unbelievably ridiculous moving the giant lovers was and like um, the uh, one woman having to like arch her back crazily to like pull the thing and um, yeah standing yeah. on um, barrels or whatever <laughs> to reach them uh, well yeah I mean it's all the scale of that is not human scale I right guess. right yeah yeah um did or when, when you write about some of these ancient peoples uh, and some of these like lore kind of things, uh, do do you go back into like older notes or game notes or uh, like a note or go back to other books in the series that reference these characters or these uh, species and stuff more? Um, mm. Now, I guess Steve's books and, and my earlier books would be where I would be going for <laughs> portrayals okay. and um, I know that uh, you know we try and and look for continuity you know, but again sometimes things don't quite work out and but we'll we do our best to, to line it up uh -huh. um, kind of on that point uh there is a great scene in uh this book very little scene uh but the mountain of the Kachain moves and causes an earthquake and there's rock slides and this has been happening uh, early on. And the uh, last remaining Crimson Guard outpost uh, falls apart or is like the mount rock slide like crushes it. Um, and this, it's a very tense scene and Blues of course is aware of what's coming and this warning. Um, and then I think it's like at the end of the chapter, uh, one of the Malazan historians just writes a nice passage about how the Malazans gloriously defeated the last remaining Crimson Guard outpost. And I, I just love how you're playing around with, with that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I, and I mean that, and also at the end of Kellen Bed's Reach, there's this great scene where Heberick is trying to figure out the age of the emperor and how to properly date things for the empire. Um, I'm just curious about how much fun you might have had writing those things. A lot of fun. Okay. Lot of fun. Uh, and of course, I'm referencing uh, similar sort of accounts, uh, sort of like Caesar's journals uh, okay. of conquest of Gaul, you know, the glorious crushing of the uh, uh, Celts, when in fact they were just, you know, uh, villagers. Right. And, and burned their village and scattered them. 
and he calls that a, a glorious victory right. uh, in in his in his accounts. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I I don't know. I think that stuff is just a ton of fun, uh, especially I I've never been a fan of the Malazan series or other series in which I'm trying to piece together an exact timeline or an exact account of all of the lore. Um, and I think, I mean, Malazan only complicates it further by the fact that many of these books and series are told by narrators within the stories themselves or it, with different relationships to the stories themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. So it seems to me that, uh, I don't know, any, it, it seems to me that a lot of continuity doesn't necessarily matter for the series. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, it would be strange if Helen had started to act totally different. Um, yeah, but... well, I hope so. And and even, you know, different regions have different counts of time and right. and different views of what's an important measure uh, for, for um, the progress of, of change. Uh, like, you know, even... Even now, I remember when uh, we were, I was living in, in Bangkok, um, teaching English, uh, my wife and I, uh, and in, in uh, Thailand, they have uh, three New Year's, oh. three different New Year's. There's, they celebrate the Western New Year, they celebrate Chinese New Year, and they celebrate Buddhist New Year. Okay. So in any one year, you've got three New Year's, and, uh -huh. uh, and they don't, whatever, you know, there's, there's three different counts of time. You could... Um, there's the Western count of time that they'll they'll use, but then there's also um, the traditional Chinese year count, which apparently we're missing three thousand years. Oh. <laughs> Here in the West, we're like our count is a bit behind theirs, and then there's the Buddhist uh, count. So even right now in our own world, uh, there are disagreements about what years to assign and how to do these counts, uh, and of course back in pre-industrial times in medieval classical era there uh, there was no consensus whatsoever even right, right. each city had its own count of time um, and when the sun was overhead that was noon uh -huh. and the noon for any one town was different than the noon for a town further north or further south or yeah. right <laughs> All right. Um, well, I, I I might think of other uh, questions and things related to that kind of Malazan March North. Um, but uh, for now, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we could shift to what's happening in the region of Falar, this archipelago uh, ruled basically, I guess, by the priests um, that worship Maal, um, God of the Seas, who any malazan fans know quite well more more person more intimately than other gods uh, so it's interesting to see such a um uh strict and uh, um, sort of power hungry and manipulative kind of uh structure kind of ruling this region that uh owes or that claims to uh, pledge allegiance to, yeah, they, they, or God they of the Seas. Claim to, yeah, right, right. So the seat of their authority, uh, right. but like any power structure, they're more interested in their own perpetuation. Uh, yeah. It's that's just the just male is just a justification. Yeah, uh, and then um, of course we have to talk about with this storyline everyone's favorite. Um, Malik Rel. Um, oh yeah, good. I'm glad he's everyone's favorite. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, eventual, eventually very successful politician. <laughs> very, uh, very capable. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember some uh, people who were commenting on the, in the world and on the series and in on YouTube, uh, saying, "Oh God, I hope we don't get Malik Rel doesn't get a makeover and and isn't doesn't get portrayed as." <laughs> some sort of misunderstood saint you know <laughs> <laughs> and i think that their their worries uh can be laid to rest oh yeah yeah he's uh he's no angel uh for sure um i i do think this is one of the and, and there's references to 
this certain I guess, cultural uh, detail I'm about to bring up in other cultures throughout the world. Uh, but this is one of, I think, one of our closest examinations of, or your closest examinations of ritual sacrifice, a uh, human sacrifice um, at, as part of religion in the series. And I, I'm just curious if you'd like to elaborate on that and the priests sacrificing women for a god, but not necessarily like the god himself might not really need or even want anything like that happening in in his name um, I, I yeah i just thought that was very interesting that was one of the things that intrigued me most about that setting and those characters <clears throat> yeah blood cults are, are very common mm -hmm. uh and it's a, of course so much power residing in in that kind of gift either taken or given uh and so um be it animals uh children, men, women, you name it. Uh, it's a very, very powerful vehicle. And therefore, the idea is it can reach uh, the gods much more directly and be much more impressive. Um, and it's, um, it's sprinkled throughout in the world. You'll see sacrifice, blood cult sacrifices in Steve's works and some other of mine, uh, because it was fairly common and still is. Uh, in some places in, of the world. Mm -hmm. And then uh, again, we are in the spoiler section, but I just want to remind everyone uh, spoilers, uh, but uh, because what I'm about to say is it was one of my favorite kind of uh, reveals um, that sort of sacrifice bringing a people closer to their God or something. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I don't know if ironic's the right word, but that the character that is sacrificed or is being brought up to, or like being raised to be sacrificed um she actually does get to meet the god uh the god of the seas uh and i thought that was a really lovely touch and uh even how sort of subtle you were at least at first um her first meeting with this old man old uh, what was it, just pot-bellied man living under the rock an impressive figure right <laughs> yeah and and you know is he or isn't he it's uh right. but um, i i hope that the readers who um are sort of following the series will recognize him that's right, right. that was my hope so there's and an he, added layer there yeah yeah and he yeah i because all the the other characters refer to him as and i think even in like the character list at the beginning it's just he's just another priest of male just an old priest of of the religion um and yeah so i i found that that was a, a lot of fun uh reading reading about that um also i noticed there is a sort of treasure hunting kind of aspect um uh, through like diving for treasure um the main character in the Falarid archipelago, she does this a lot, or she's very good at this because of her control of waters. Uh, or I, I assume that's what makes it just a, an easy, easier job for her. Um, mm -hmm. But this wasn't the first time I read one of your books in which there was a sort of hunt for treasure uh, kind of thing going on. I That was one of my favorite things about um, one of your books from your first series, uh, Orbs Up the Throne. Um, I'm going through uh, Moonspawn looking for loot and whatnot. Uh, also, everyone in working in the Kachain structure or going in there is a little like they're, they're constantly thinking, oh, there must be all of these rubies and gemstones and things around that we could take and make ourselves rich. I, I guess I'm curious, is some of that like does that come from gaming a little bit? Because I know like the treasure hunt is maybe a slightly more common structure for a gaming session. Uh, I, I'm curious I'm curious about that. And yeah, if that stuff's fun to write or not. It, um, I don't know if it's not, it's not direct, but I think that there is a, a holdover from our old um, dungeon crawling games. Uh, and uh, I forget who um, someone pointed out that going through the uh, crashed moon spawn, uh -huh. uh, sort of like a dungeon crawl, and right, it, right, you know, it's uh, just you know unavoidable that. And um, 
but uh, say for uh, treasure for, for a sale in most, I think is, is most directly addresses right. The, right. Uh, where an entire region is being um, opened up and just bes bespoiled by a gold rush, essentially. Right, right. And of course, living in Alaska, there's um, a lot to draw on for that. Uh -huh. oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, so yeah, they, so they're hunting for gems in the uh, Katane Shamal in, uh, in, installation. Uh, and um, Falar, for me, when I was writing it, I saw it sort of as an Eastern Mediterranean, Aegean sort of setting. Mm -hmm. and the islands were like the, uh, like the Ionia. Um, the sea is very warm and shallow, uh, and there's lots of wrecks um, to, to, be, to be hunted for. Uh, and so that, to me, really it felt like it was helping to convey the um, cultural setting. Okay. I, there was one storyline uh, in the Falar setting that every time we went there, I, I thought, this is interesting. I'm not exactly sure why we're here or who this is. Um, and uh, the character's name, Im... Uh, Imnaj? It, 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 yes. It, Im, Imanaj, Imanaj, yes. Something um, like that. Don't have yeah. it with me. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah, just back up. Um, I, well, I, I thought the action uh, scenes with him uh, were very interesting. And once um, Kellen Ved's raiders and pirates uh, got there, I, I thought, okay, this is, this makes sense. This is a window into basically what's, what Kellen Bed was counting on happening on these different islands. Like I, I, I thought, okay, okay, that's great. Um, and then uh, at the end of the book, jumping all the way uh, to the end, uh, Imanaj turns out to be very important. Um, very, uh, and he uh, delivers a nice little message saying, oh, we don't have to worry about the Malazans. And of course he's in, the, he's in uh, Aaron um, up north. And I, I assume this is a tease for where we're going in the next book. Um, uh, yeah, it, did what was he going to be in this story all along, or did you include him to start kind of setting up maybe future future mm -hmm. books? Um, yeah, he was there from the beginning of this concept for the for Forge, uh, and. Um, Readers of the genre are often very well educated in the different sort of scenarios that can be presented. And so I wanted to have a character set up in on an island that looks like the sort of traditional save the village sort of mm -hmm. setup. Okay, yeah. Uh, and then when the uh, bandits come or uh, um, the raiders, these wretched pirates, um, he's they they say you know oh come you know save us save the village and he says no I don't want to save the village right. I just want <laughs> give my all your give him all your money and they'll go away you know what's <laughs> what's your problem uh, so I, I wanted to overturn that okay yeah and he he does he just lets them go and he doesn't fight them and call them a coward but he doesn't care what they think um, so but then. Of course, full spoiler. I guess we're going full spoiler yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. He sees that they're stealing the wood that he wants to, <laughs> to fix his boat, and so he goes, "Oh no, they're taking my." So he goes down and says, "You know, just just this lumber. You, you can take everything else. I don't care, but leave the lumber." And they said, "No, we need it," and and that just then escalates. Right. Right. Then, then that's cause enough. That's something worth worth defending. <laughs> yeah, he wanted his boat fixed. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, I uh, with the Raiders. Uh, I uh, Carthron Crust is a character I didn't know I was going to enjoy as much as I do. Uh, but ever since uh, book two of your Path to Ascendancy series, uh, I really enjoy Carthron Crust. Uh, and in this book. 
him uh, constantly complaining about why do we have these horrible, disloyal, nonsense pirates with us when we could have actual soldiers uh, with yeah. us. I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, I, I guess of all of that kind of Napan crew, I'm curious why uh, why you chose to give us a lot of the that uh, kind of old guard those scenes through his uh, through his perspective. Uh, why why you've made him kind of at least our lens uh, into those things? Well, um, perhaps because we Steve and I have both spent a lot of time with him, uh, he's easy to sort of pick up and run with and I have a lot of sympathy for him and uh, I like him a lot as a, a a vehicle to look at things because his is sort of the classical um, military point of view mm -hmm. um, which is a something that you know are you could say that we're looking at and and studying uh, and so we need to have that point of view being conveyed uh, the sort of standard organized um <clears throat> servant of servant of the empire um point of view uh okay. and he's a good vehicle for that um okay. uh and i think that the book itself is um one of the another one of the things i was trying to do was to set it apart was i thought that i would sort of go back to my own uh book roots and uh, say Night of Knives and Return of the Crimson Guard and have something that's um, a lot more action driven and plot driven, right? Then say the prior three in mm -hmm. uh, Path of Ascendancy. Uh, so um, I wanted to, you know, do something different and shake, shake things up and have the readers maybe not have their expectations met in some ways. Okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, let let's talk about the uh, the uh, Gistol Gistol. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, this massive giant wave that is summoned uh, by sacrificing the high priestess uh, of of Maal. Um, and yeah, I, I guess was this ever a threat, or was this ever an element that? Uh, you all faced while you were gaming uh was this something that and, and i mean i know in the other series of uh, characters reference priests of the Gisal and things like that um was this specifically what it was and how it summoned what it was used for um did you develop that for this book uh or 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 flesh it out for this book or has it existed for a while um, <clears throat> it wasn't, it wasn't in our gaming. Uh, okay. yeah. All that happened is that um, we had this um, byword for terror and fear uh, in the region. There's just, uh, no one knew in uh, Quantali what it was. It was okay. just a word. And people would say, well, that just all priest. Um, so I decided, okay, I'm going to reveal what it is and so i had to think about well what is it then okay. uh, uh, and uh normally of course uh what people imagine is it would just be a, a huge monster mm -hmm. a, sort of a, a kraken sort of figure you know from greek mythology uh, this giant uh sea monster and i thought well that's been done so much uh, we're trying to do different things mm -hmm. and so i thought well okay it would be just as terrible and like some a massive obliterating um tidal wave and and so um that's what i decided to make it and of course it's being granted by mail so it uh, made, made perfect sense right right uh and then um i mean i guess we see it we see it used three times sort of in, in the book. Uh, the first time, very early in the prologue, uh, which broke my heart because it's the librarians and I used to be a librarian and now I work in a museum now. It's just all those things. Um, and they just see this massive wave coming to destroy their island and all their records and uh, mm -hmm. everything. Uh, and then the second time uh, we saw it, uh, or we see it, Kellenbed basically faces it on his own. 
um, and takes it somewhere. So I, I would uh, love to hear you uh, explain more how you kind of fit those two ele elements of the Malazan world together. And yeah. Right. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And um, Kellen, he didn't really know if he could do it, <laughs> but he thought he would try. <laughs> Overextended himself a bit. Uh, but yes, he sort of transports this massive amount of water to shadow. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this lake in, in the, one of the broken territories. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we've seen this before. I think in Steve's books, we had people in boats uh, in shadow. Uh, mm -hmm. where there didn't be a lake there. Right. Uh, and so we're, we're always playing with um, different epochs geological and human sort of interrelated and on top of each other so at one time there might have been a lake there and our echoes of that still but that was you know long long ago um just like in central canada there's a flat rich farmland because that's the bottom of a lake you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. years ago there was a huge lake there and now we're scraping its bottom for all the nutrients that <laughs> uh -huh. fell out into the soil there all right all right uh and then i uh i just <laughs> the uh people of shadow the different um species and uh sort of a random uh beings that live there and find themselves there eventually and they're worshiping Kalanved as <laughs> as their god who's I guess in a way he is, he certainly affects a lot of change in their world and um, wields a lot of power there. Um, but I, I just love them and the, now I, I can't remember or I, I might, may have gotten it confused. Were these the same people um, as the sort of insect-like uh, species that Dan Kellen Vett and Dancer come across mm -hmm. in like Deadhouse Landing or, or are they different types of Different sort of like cousins. Um, okay, okay. Similar species. Okay. <laughs> great, great. Um, yeah, uh, and then I guess the third time that uh, that this giant wave is used, uh, it has now been given over the power. The priests of Mael no longer have this power anymore because they've uh, abused it. Um, they're, you know, can't be trusted. Uh, and especially with Malagrel in their in their midst, um, and um, so it's been given to this massive responsibility has been given to. If Tasha is not the main, like the other main character of this story, um, and she uses it to try and stop the moving mountain from destroying the archipelago, um, I guess that shift of power away from the priests to her. I'm, I'm, I would just love to hear your your thoughts on that that whole dynamic. Um, it's about sort of the the hijacking of a cult, if you will, uh, the, the the male priesthood take over an older cult that had um, which was which could traditionally had the gift to to summon this um, protective weapon, but uh, that cult that belief structure. Um, gets hijacked and taken over by the, the priests of male, and they uh, use it as a, a weapon of terror. And then uh, in the course of the book, it gets returned to its roots and, and back to the original holders of, of that gift. Um, and it's not <clears throat> there, it's not a sort of a blood coat power statement it's more of a gift that they're allowed to use if they so choose sure. all right all right that's it, it's lovely and i just yeah it's a i feel like it's a fairly positive um kind of optimistic ending for a lot of a lot of the characters um and i mean if of course, then the uh, unassailable um, uh, final kind of like castle or fortress uh, in uh, the uh, uh, Kabul or uh, Kabil uh, Island uh, in uh -huh. Pilar. Um, their, their temple, let's say. Right, right. Um, and just, I, 
I guess, I mean, just getting to the end of the book, after everything's happened with the Kachane Mountain and everything's happened with um, the the last time we see the uh, the, the just all used, uh, then it kind of seems like, okay, well, yeah, sure. Now, now obviously the Malazans are going to come on in, have their sort of fake siege on the seaside, and then the actual forces are just going to take over. Um, and then we get to see how Malik Rell brilliantly set up other people as fall fall guys, I guess, for uh, for everything that happened there. Um, I thought that was that was very fascinating. Uh, I'm curious. I, again, I you know, I, I, if you holding certain secrets or you know, if you're saving things for future books, um, no, no no need to answer. Or anything like that, but uh, will we see more of Malik Rell in more of these books? Or yeah, yeah. Um, because Malik is um, future history. We we know what happens to, right, to him. Right. He had to have. He couldn't die. Right. He had to have an out. Right. And so I had. So he made. He was careful, and he had a whole bunch of different routes, possible escape that he was setting up. Um, over the course of the book uh, and yes eventually he like the squirmy oily untrustworthy fellow who he is he manages to come out in the end uh, and and um, by throwing everyone else under the bus yeah. <laughs> uh, and because with each book I'm trying you know different regions and different uh, concepts I I tend to pick up different characters with each sure. set so I think that the likelihood of seeing him is is low. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, hmm. Oh, I I had something in the back of my mind, and it just totally, totally left me. Um, <laughs> I, I I guess I, I talked a little about this in my review. Um, one of the things that I was trying to pick up on uh, on like a, a thematic level, uh, here was sort of this idea of persistence and it, you fail and then you keep trying again, uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and I, it wasn't like a fully formed thought, uh, but I, just to support that, I was kind of drawing on, okay, so they try and attack, or Tayshran and company try and attack the mountain once. And then even though it was perilous and it was dangerous and terrifying that first time, who cares they they have a job to do so they're going to go do it again near the end um and then uh i don't there's just a number of escape attempts uh that just no matter what got to get out of this horrible situation um I, I i i'm curious if that's something that you were exploring or if that might just me be me picking just a, up on a couple of random storylines I don't know. I don't, maybe it's just where I was at that time. Uh, but um, yes, like Jana, she has like three, I think three different escape attempts or at least two and is mm -hmm. dragged back. Uh, and we know that this is recurring. Um, <clears throat> they are try and infiltrate this, the Katane Shemal artifact, but are fail and have to go back and try again. Um, She's uh, searching for treasure and failing again and again, but has to try again to get the treasure. That's true. Uh, and then within the um, installation, they try and uh, get a start once fail. Uh, <laughs> and then he wants to try again. And so they have to, there's multiple attempts to get it running. Uh, so there, there, there could be, uh, there's a lot of recurring ideas about um, tackling problems and in, in, in coming at them in new and different ways and not giving up. Okay, okay. Uh, are, are there other um, kind of specific themes that you were exploring that you'd, you'd kind of love to see if people might start picking up on as they get to this book? Um, well, it's something that you can find just about in uh, any of our works. Uh, like you've mentioned Blood and Bone, for example. Uh -huh. Um, and that's uh, mythology and myth making, uh, and how myths are created, and what you know, whose 
narrating them and trying to control them and using them for certain purposes. And then maybe it gets adopted and used for a different purpose. And so it's all about the, the paths and the routes of, of this myth-making uh, and as a process and how it works or fails uh, or just suddenly blossoms. Uh, and we, we see that occurring again and again uh, through uh, mine and Steve's uh, works. Oh. oh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, uh, I am curious, uh, are, is there anything, maybe on that thematic level, uh, anything unique to the book that you're currently working on that, uh, again, you know, of course, without giving things away, but that you um that you're excited to be exploring for the first time or anything like that mm. um yeah i don't want to give too much away sure. in the sense i haven't done it yet so what oh, if sure. i, <laughs> I change my mind you know <laughs> so, but he but, said <laughs> but this myth making idea is certainly present okay great. Uh, and, uh, the creation of history and uh the uh, events being seen from the ground level you know, how big events, how, you know, looking not from the point of view of the victors, but the point of view of those who are uh, suffering through the, those events on, on the ground level. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I guess also with this fifth book, uh, again, no pressure, no rush. I, I, uh, I love the, uh, this most recent book. So, you know, I, I hope you don't feel uh, too well, rough. Hope, it, um, it'll, it'll be different because it'll be a new project, and I'm going to do some. It's going to be quite different from in in terms of a, the concept and the the um, how it plays out. But uh, okay. I hope it's and it'll just it'll continue the story of these um, early campaigns. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, and I guess also if this book winds up uh, spending a lot of time in the seven cities region um or any time at all from what i understand um erickson is also writing a book that might spend some time there uh so does that kind of go along with what you were saying earlier about how you two have been speaking more with each other um or... i don't know about he just simply had decided that it would be nice to have a, a sort of a um a subplot Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, yeah. Okay. Whereas this will be the main. It'll pretty much be the main setting for me. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Um. Well, I, I'm not sure that I have too many more like specific questions about Forge of the mm -hmm. High Mage. Um. Is there any any character storyline that we haven't really spoken about that you'd love to comment on, or you're wondering how how I, I received them or felt about them or anything like that? Um, well, you know, it's not for me to, um, sort of point at things. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, but I, um, I would hope that the readers came away <clears throat> with a sense of, uh, growing, um, tensions within the Malazan hierarchy, uh, and even within the Crimson Guard, uh, mm -hmm. and that we then see played out later in, uh, yeah. other books. Yeah. And well, yeah, of course, there's the Crimson Guard, even a small group of uh, four there, they're debating which which Crimson Guard campaign should we should we go to, which and then that even splits that group. So that that definitely makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I may um, end it here if that's all right. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, watching. Have a great day. Bye. Well, thank you.